gonna look bad. <laughs> Praise the Lord. How many of you feel the wonderful presence of Jesus? One of my mentors, he, he likes to say quite often, he says, isn't Jesus wonderful? He's wonderful. Look at your neighbor and say, isn't Jesus wonderful? Hallelujah. Today we're talking about the spirit of truth. I don't have it anywhere near the time that I need to extrapolate this and really drill down on it. We, we, we're going to get it started and we're going to flow over into next week. Is that okay? We're just going to flow over into next week. For those of you that uh, are not aware, those of you, you may be joining us for the very first time, whether you're a first time visitor here, we welcome you to the Restoration Place Church where we help people to experience a journey to belong, believe, and become all they were meant to be in Christ. That speaks to your potential. Say there's potential in God. But it's not just potential in God. God, God, God is not just about us uh, having, having potential. God's about us realizing our potential. Hallelujah. And we, we want to see what we believe. Hallelujah. We want to see what God said. We want to walk it out. And uh, so we welcome you to the Restoration Place. If you're first time visiting for the first time, whether virtually or in person, we've been in a series for the last four weeks. Uh, we were out last week on vacation, but we've been in a series called Holy Ghost. Somebody shout Holy Ghost. Come on, shout it. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Pastor Tyler taught last week. On the Holy Spirit, the person. Holy Spirit, the person. Holy Spirit, the person. Did an extraordinary job. Thank you, Pastor Tyler. Thank you for helping us to see Tyler, a Tiger Woods in a whole different light. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, you may be seated. Uh, I, I normally give a scripture for us to just chew on, but we're going to do some reading this morning. We're going to go through some scripture this morning, but I'm going to start out with a point of review. Holy Spirit, you're already here. We don't need to welcome you. Our worship has welcomed you. So we, may, we say now have your way. Shout with me, everybody, on the count of three. Let's go, Holy Ghost. One, two, three. Let's go, Holy Ghost! And that's what I want you to say whenever you're getting ready to expect something from the word. What I want you to say? What I want you to say? One more time. What do you need to say? Let's go Holy Ghost. So Holy Ghost is ready to go to work. Amen. Praise God. Um, just as a quick point of review, why is it important to know the Holy Spirit as a person? It's essential for us to know the Holy Spirit as a person. The person of the Holy Spirit. The person of the Holy Ghost. Those words are interchangeable. The person of the Holy Spirit. The person of the Holy Ghost. We know that this is essential because Jesus was very emphatic about his instructions to his disciples. Do not depart Jerusalem. Acts chapter 1 verse 4. But wait. Somebody shout wait. He said, but wait there for the what? For the promise of the Father. The Holy Spirit typically, you all, you need to understand this. The Holy Spirit is typically the element when there is no success, he's typically the missing element. He's typically the element that is missing from the equation. And that's spiritually speaking, of course. He's typically the element that is missing from the equation. That's why I say, let's go Holy Ghost. I invite the Holy Ghost to go before me and to come with me and come behind me whenever I'm getting ready to do something on his behalf, on God's behalf. I invite the Holy Spirit because typically the Holy Spirit is the missing element where success has not been experienced. It is only through the Holy Ghost that we yield any fruit in our lives. And I walk with Christ. Say it's only through the Holy Spirit. Jesus, he instructed his disciples in Acts 1.8. He says, but you shall receive what? Somebody shout power. But you shall receive power 
after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, upon you, not just in you, upon you. Know that you are dwelt, Holy Spirit dwelt, say I'm spirit dwelt, dwelt. That means that the Holy Spirit dwells on the inside of you. If you have invited Christ into your life, then you have invited the Spirit of Christ to come and dwell on the inside of you. In your spirit being, he's come to, to cohabitate with your spirit. Somebody say, he's dwelling with me right now. But it's not enough just to be indwelt. That's why Jesus told his disciples, he said, it would have been one thing if he, he's very specific in his instructions. He very easily could have said, wait for the Holy Spirit to come on the inside of you. No, he says, wait for the Holy Spirit to come where? Upon you. Say on me. It's one thing for some to come in you. It's another thing for something to come on you. Pastor Charlie, can you bring me my bottle of water there? Thank you, sir. This is spirit indwelt. I'm drinking them up. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Every time you hear the word, every time you read the word, you're doing this. If the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you, you're taking them in. At the point of salvation, you that's why he said, take, taste and see. Say, taste and see. Now, this water do not ne necessarily have any taste, but he said, take a drink of me. That's what he was inviting the woman to do at the well. Take, take a drink of living water. So, so I can come and dwell with you. But now this is what happened on the day of Pentecost. Hallelujah. Somebody say he got on them. I started to use Pastor Tyler, but I didn't think he'd appreciate that, so. Now, you got to understand something. The power of something getting on you. Hallelujah. It takes care of the outside and the inside. How many of y'all have ever rubbed uh, any type of topical medicine on you? Ladies, I know. Many of you do. You know, I've, I've, I've watched my wife. She has this, you know, topical hormones and uh, she... Okay, don't share that. Okay. All right. Ladies la ladies have topical hormones. She don't want me to say Jeanette has topical hormones. I'll say ladies. Ladies have topical hormones and they and they rub it <laughs> and they rub it into their skin, but it don't get on your skin and stay on your skin. It gets in you. Hallelujah. Somebody said go straight into your bloodstream. And that's how it makes this proper impact. And so he says, wait on the essential element. The Holy Ghost will come where? Upon you. So that you can be witnesses of me. And he said, no. It didn't say so you can be witnesses. It says, and you shall be witnesses. Say you shall be witnesses. You shall be witnesses of me. Thank you, Monte. Thank you, Travis. Still in a point of review, the person of the Holy Spirit is not a force. Say he's not a force. He's not a power necessarily alone. He's not just a power. Say he's not just a power. He's not just a power. That's not who he is. He's not just a power to be used. You don't get to use the Holy Spirit. Like he's something to get a hold of. No, the Holy Spirit is looking to help me preach to get a hold of us. So he's not just a force. He's not just a power. Of course, Pastor Tyler, he used last week a, a, a great example, I thought, of uh, he brought some golf clubs in here with him. And he said, these golf clubs... Just by using these golf clubs that Tiger Woods plays with, it's not necessarily going to help you play like Tiger Woods. I wish it was like that. 
Everybody be running to get those golf clubs. But it doesn't work that way. Somebody say the it is not greater than the person. So the Holy Spirit is a person. He's not just an it. He's not an it. He, it's not that he's not just an it. He's not an it. He's a person. So the word of God proved to us last week that the Holy Spirit is a what? Is a person. So I want to continue this discourse of what the Holy Ghost is not. Number one, the Holy Ghost, or to continue in this discourse, the Holy Ghost is not a concept. I was meditating on this thought this week, Pastor Tyler, that the Holy Spirit is not a concept. Thank you. He's not a concept. Say the Holy Ghost is greater than a concept. Come on, I need you to get this, you all. The Holy Ghost is greater than a concept. John Lennon, he wrote a song, and the lyrics to this song, the song was called God. Everybody know who, who, I'm, who I'm referencing when I say John Lennon? Remember him and, him and Yoko? Uh, and he was with the Beatles. John Lennon, rest his soul, he, he wrote a song called God. And he penned the lyrics in this song, God. It says, God is a concept by which we measure our pain. I'll say it again. God is a concept by which we measure our pain. I don't believe in magic. I don't believe in I Ching. I don't believe in the Bible. I don't believe Tarot. I don't believe Hitler. I don't believe Jesus. I don't believe Kennedy. I don't believe Buddha. I don't believe Mantra. I don't believe Jita. I don't believe Yoga. I don't believe Kings. I don't believe in Elvis. I don't believe Zimmerman. I don't believe the Beatles. I just believe in me, Yoko and me. And that's really reality. The dream is over. What can I say? The dream is over. Yesterday I was a dream weaver, but now I'm reborn. I was a walrus, but now I'm John. And so, dear friends, you just have to carry on. The dream is over. I don't know what you believe. I don't know what you feel about John Lennon. And, but, but can I tell you something? Those words are so far from the truth as it relates to God. And I don't know where he was before, right before he met his maker. I'm not for sure. I have no idea. It's not me to judge that. But what I will say is this. Before that point, leading up to that point, he was in a bad disposition and mindset. Because I'm wondering, what did he believe in? He didn't believe in nothing but himself. He said God is just a concept. <laughs> just like Confucianism. Or Buddhism. It's just a concept. See, you can refer to God as an it if God was just a concept. But say God is greater than a concept. I'm glad I, I, can, I can sense you all are listening. Y'all are leaning in. God is greater than a concept. Say it. He's greater than a concept. In the day and generation in which we live, come on, you need to say that at least 10 times a day. You need to remind yourself of that. Come on, say it. God is greater than a concept. God is greater than a concept. God is greater than a concept. God is great. Teach your children. God is greater than a concept. God is greater than what they teach you he is in school. God is greater than what the philosophy teacher teaches you that God is in college. God is greater than a concept. Greater than a concept. Write this down. God is not just a theory to be pondered or proven. Say God is greater than a theory. There's a whole lot of great theories out there. Theory of relativity. You know, they call it the law of relativity. Law of gravity. But God is not just a theory. God is greater than a theory. 
You can't prove God out. Now, I know he says, try me, but listen, God is already proven. He's telling you to try him for yourself. That's for your own benefit. But you're not trying him to give him any validity. You're not trying God to give him any more credibility than what he already has. Ah, uh, I'll be my own choir and, and clap audience this morning because I know I'm talking real, real good this morning. God is greater than just a theory. Theories come and go. Theories can be studied out. And yeah, if, if you want to study to get to know God greater, yes, you can do that. But he's greater than just a theory. God, write this down, is not just a principle. He's not just a principle to be studied. You study principles. You study mathematical equations. And that's all good. And I believe God put all that in the earth to prove he's God. But he's greater than that. Say he's greater than that. Say it again. He's greater than that. Because even when I can't get the theory right, God is still God. Even when I can't get the principle, when, when I can't memorize the principle, I know God. I wish somebody would say something in here. Somebody say, even when you can't memorize the principle, he's still God. He's still God. If I wake up and I barely remember the principle from day to day, all I got to say is God. And he's right there. Say, he's greater than the principle. He's greater than, yes, yes, yes. There are principles that go along with God, but he's greater than the principle. He created the principle. He's not just a principle to be studied. Some people, most of their life, all they do is just study God. They never believe him, but they study him. Now, you can't study your way up on belief, I believe. I've seen people do it. I know a medical doctor, Dr. Rex Russell. He was an atheist. He was a self-identified atheist. He did not believe in God. There was a God. But he said the more he studied science, the more his knowledge about science brought him into the revelation that there must be a God. Somebody said there is a God. So God, listen, I'm not preaching against science or any of those things. I'm not preaching against any of that because all those things matriculated from God. I'm just telling you, God is greater than a principle. Write this down. God is not just an act. He's not just an act. A-C-T. He's, he's, he's not just an act. And act. Some people see God or the Holy Spirit because we're, we're talking specifically this morning about the Holy Spirit. And you say, well, you're using God and the Holy Spirit interchangeably. Yeah, you're right. Absolutely. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to present to you the deity of the Holy Spirit. I know this is a touchy, touchy subject because uh, China, uh, the little actress, which I so, I so appreciate, she's doing a wonderful job. Of, of, of shedding light in the midst of darkness. And, and recently, from what I understand, having heard the whole thing, she's been uh, speaking her opinion about the Trinity. Now, she does say it's just her opinion. Now, I'm not here this morning to talk to you about the Trinity. I'm just telling you in a couple of weeks, we're going to talk about the deity of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a part of the Godhead. Say that the Holy Spirit is a part of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit has deity. Now, I don't want to jump into a couple of weeks from now, but the Holy Spirit does have deity. But the Holy Spirit, yes, the Holy Spirit and God, the reason I've been saying God and Holy Spirit is because they're synonymous. And the Holy Spirit is a manifestation of God. Say Holy Spirit is a manifestation of God. Manifestation of God. Manifestation of God. It's like... I'm a father, but I'm also a son, but I'm also a friend, <laughs> all in one person. I said all in one person. I said all in one person. Now, I'm going to tell you, 
I'm just going to go ahead and say it so I can open up a can of worms. I'm not too for sure about what I believe necessarily or if I'm so bought into that God is three people. I believe God is one person with three manifestations. Because I'm one person who just happens to be a husband, who just happens to be a father, who just happens to be a son, who just happens to also be somebody's friend. One per all that in one person. And all of those functions or manifestations from time to time they submit to each other. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? I ain't lost nobody in here, have you? They submit to each other. In my doctoral program, we've been, we've been studying how deity can submit to deity. How, and, and I'm not going to take you to seminary this morning, so don't worry. Uh, but, but we've been studying how when Jesus came into earth, he was all God. He came into earth all God. Philippians chapter 2, 5. Jesus came into the earth and said he did not consider it robbery. Come on, you theologians, you, those of you that know the scripture. He didn't consider it robbery for what? To be considered equal with God, but yet to have to give up or to surrender, to surrender his divine rights. So deity found a way to surrender itself. Deity submitted. To deity. Oh, that's too much for y'all this morning. Okay. Jesus Christ being equal with God. I didn't say it. The Bible said it. Jesus Christ being equal with God. Say it with me. Jesus Christ being equal with God. He did not consider it robbery. He did not consider it an unjust thing. <laughs> Hallelujah. He didn't consider it unjust. To come to earth, and, and in, my, in my theological studies, I come to understand that Jesus Christ, the way he functioned as God, but yet son of man in the earth, is when he came, before he even came out of Mary's womb, he made the determination that he was going to surrender his divine rights to operate in the supernatural as God. Now, he operated in the supernatural as man, but he surrendered his divine rights to operate in his supernatural as God. He surrendered it. He totally surrendered it. How do you know that? Because he told Pilate, thank God for the word of God. He told Pilate, Pilate said, don't you know that I have the power and the authority to release you? And Jesus says, don't you know I have the authority right now? In this body to call on legions, y'all not talking back to me, to call on legions of angels. Come on, you need to thank God for the word of God. We don't have to be left in the dumb because we got the word of God. He says, don't you know I can call on legions? A legion is anywhere from 6,004 or from 4,006 to 6,004 angels. He says, I got the ability not just to call on one legion, but legions. But he says, but I won't do it because I've already surrendered that right. <laughs> Come on, put your hands together for that. Don't y'all play me like y'all already knew that. So the Holy Spirit is what I'm trying to say. The Holy Spirit. Glory to God. Just like Jesus is equal with God. He's equal with God. But, but he submits in the role. In the manifestation, in his title, hallelujah. We're going to talk the rest of our time, and I only got about 10 minutes. We're going to talk the rest of our time about the title of the Holy Spirit. Say the title of the Holy Spirit. What is the title of the Holy Spirit? I'm going to go ahead and give you, this is an open book test, so I'm going to go ahead and give you the answer before uh, we talk about it. Uh, the title of the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Truth. Write that down. That's actually the title of the message, the spirit of truth, the spirit of truth. Now, the Bible refers to the spirit of truth as a sword. The Bible refers to the spirit of truth 
as a sword. Say the sword of the spirit. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17, verse 18. Y'all can relax because I'm not going to start wielding it out in the audience. Ephesians 6, 17 through 18 says this. Embrace the power of salvation's full deliverance. Like, this is the Passion Translation, like a helmet to protect your thoughts from lies. Say, from lies. And take the mighty razor-sharp spirit sword, spirit sword, say spirit sword, of the spoken word of God. What's the spirit sword? What's the spirit sword represent? The spoken word of God. What's the spirit sword represent? Come on, what's the spirit sword represent? Again, what's the spirit sword represent? The spoken word of God. It says, take the spirit sword, which is the word of God. Watch this. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the what? Spirit. Now, let's demystify the word of God. Let's demystify. Let's, let's break it down into layman's, layman's terms. What, what it's saying when it says praying always, pray always, God. How do you pray always? It says, open up your mouth and talk like God. Always. Every time you open up your mouth, talk like God. Every time you open up your, every time you speak to something, stop, 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 stop complaining about it. Speak to it. Because that's what God would do. Jesus spoke to mountains. Jesus spoke to sea. He spoke to storms. He spoke to winds and waves. He spoke to it. Somebody say, speak to it. How do you speak to it? With the word of God. Say so you got to use the word. You got to wield a sword. You got to wield a sword of the spirit. Say so he's the spirit of truth. The new king, the new king, <laughs> you can tell I'm country. I say new king James. The new king James version reads like this. And take the heaven of salvation and watch this. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Whatever I, whatever comes out of my mouth, whatever I do, I need to do it in the, I need to do it in the spirit. I can't do it in the spirit if I'm doing it in the flesh. Say, I can't do it in the spirit if I'm doing it in the flesh. So how do I do it in the spirit and not do it in the flesh? I have to surrender to the Holy Spirit. Say, I have to surrender to his influence. I have to surrender to his, his leading. I have to surrender to his guidance. I have to surrender. I have to, watch this. Y'all not going to like this. I have to surrender to his control. Say, I have to let him control me. Say, I got to let him control me. He's not going to take control, but you have to give him control. I'm preaching real good. Watch this. John, uh, Jesus actually referred to the Holy Ghost. He referred to the Holy Ghost in John chapter 6, verse 63. He referred to him as the spirit of truth. He says, the Holy Spirit is the one who gives life. Say that. The Holy Ghost gives life. It says, the Holy Spirit is the one who gives life. That which is of the natural realm is of no help. The words I speak to you, Jesus is saying this, I speak to you, they are spirit, watch this, capital S, and life. But there are still some of you who won't believe. Jesus, he referred to the Holy Spirit. He says, the Holy Spirit, he is the one who gives life. And it is the Holy Spirit, he is the one who that when I speak those words, these are words that are representing the Holy Spirit and life. James chapter 1 verse 5 says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Hallelujah. And God will give them liberally. Watch this. And the King James Version, I don't, I don't really like that particular version for that scripture, says, and he upbraideth not. Because that doesn't really tell me what he is not doing. 
When I went back and studied out in its original text in the Aramaic, it says, and he won't make you ashamed for asking. Somebody said, God won't ashamed me. He won't, he won't make, he won't embarrass you for asking on his level. Glory to God. He won't, he won't embarrass you for asking you to heal you of uh, heal you of some disease. God says, I won't embarrass you for that. So the Holy Spirit gives wisdom, the spirit of truth. That's why he's the spirit of truth, because we need this spirit of truth in our lives if we're going to act. God would never give us instructions to do anything that he wouldn't give us the wherewithal to do it with. He says, ask me for wisdom. And so if I ask God for something, he has to have a mechanism in place to give me what I'm asking for. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so if I ask for wisdom, who's, who's in place to give it to me? No. Yes, God. But who? The Holy Spirit. Say, let's go, Holy Ghost. All right. I got five minutes and I'm done. The devil. So if we got the spirit of truth, if we got the spirit of truth, there is also the spirit of error or untruth. <laughs> if Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. That's his title. Somebody say his title is the spirit of truth. The devil's title is the spirit of error. Or spirit of deception. Spirit of error, spirit of deception. So if there is a spirit of truth, there's also a spirit of error. So you have to be careful for the spirit of error. The devil is a deceiver. The Bible says in John chapter 8, verse 44, the Passion Translation, I need you to know what this deceiver is, who he is, who the devil is, who this spirit of error is. John chapter 8, verse 44 says, you are of your father, the devil. <laughs> this is Jesus talking to the Pharisees. But you tell folk that on, on the street, you don't have a fight on your hand. You acting like your daddy the devil. That's what he was telling. He said, you acting like your daddy the devil. He says, you are of your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. Watch this. He's talking about the deceiver. He was a murderer. What was he? From the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. It says there's no truth in the devil. Hallelujah. And so whenever you are hearing error, you are hearing the devil. Whenever you are hearing a untruth or whenever you are not hearing truth, it is the devil. I'm taking my time with this because, and we're going to work through this methodically because we are living in a generation of error. We are living in a generation of that, 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 that is so gullible to receive untruths. To where we have been taught that God is a concept. We've been taught that God is a principle. We've been taught that God is just an act. Even the churches got caught up in it. That God, that, that the Holy Spirit is nothing more than an act. That, that all the Holy Spirit is for is speaking in tongues. No, he is more than an act. Hallelujah. I said, he is more than an act. I feel the Holy Ghost now. He is more than speaking in tongues. He is more than prophesying. He is more. He is more. Hallelujah. He's greater than a theory. He's greater than a concept. He's greater than an act. He's greater than a principle. We've even had the church to relegate him just to being a, a, a principle. He's a principle to be studied. We teach on the Holy Spirit, and we need to teach on the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. But we never see him as a person. He is the spirit of truth. Say, he is the spirit of truth. He is the spirit of truth. He is the spirit of truth. I, wasn't, I'm, I really wasn't going to do this till next week, but Pastor Ty, uh, uh, no, let me call my wife, because I, I, I don't. <laughs> Y'all will see why I didn't call Pastor Tyler after, after I do this. Can you turn this way, sweetheart? No. 
Uh-oh, let me do something. Because, see, she'll embarrass me. You don't need none, trust me. <laughs> Come up on stage with me, please. Now, you turn that way. No, you turn that way. There you go. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Can't y'all see me doing Pastor Tyler like that? (sighs) If you didn't know I was behind you, if I just snuck up on you, and you were in a room by yourself, but I stealthily snuck up on you, and maybe you don't hear the beep, (sighs) but you just hear about to say something else. (laughs) You would know somebody is standing behind you, right? Because, now, 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 what sense does that make, though? Because when you came in the room, you were by yourself, seemingly. But I snuck up on you. How did you know I was there? I felt But you could also feel what on your ear? My breath. You ain't helping me preach good. (laughs) Come on down here. It's an eerie thing when you don't think somebody's there, but you but you but you can feel somebody's presence. And the Bible refers to the Holy Spirit as the pneuma of God. It's the breath, the breath of God. It's, it's, it's the breath. And, and, and you can't talk without blowing out some what? Some breath, some, some air, some breath, some breath. And so when we say the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, it literally is representing God, the person. And so it is the word of God. It is the truth of God who represents the person of God that shows up to keep us out of error. Somebody put your hands together and thank God for delivering you from the spirit of error. Come on, stand to your feet. You can get more excited than that. Come on, thank God for giving thank God for giving me victory over the spirit of error. Thank God that when I pray and open up my mouth, when I'm in indecision, when I don't know the way, I can say to God, back to his word. You say, God, You said in your word, James 1 and 3, let them who lacks wisdom, let them ask of God and he will give them liberally and upbraid not. Open up your mouth and I will show you great and mighty things. I don't have to be left in error. I don't have to be left in indecision. Error is not just the wrong information. Error is not knowing. To be left in error is to be left in a place of not knowing the truth. I don't have to stay there. I'm not relegated. I'm not relegated to that disposition. When I open up my mouth and I say, God, how do you want me to do that? He begins to speak to me. That's what the spirit of truth does. Spirit of truth comes to lead you. Pastor Tyler said it last week. To guide you. To order your steps. Glory to God. Oh yes. Also to comfort you. When the truth shows up you know it. Because you feel peace. You feel you feel comfort. Somebody say I feel comfort from the truth right now. You don't know if you should marry that man or not. 
You don't know if you should marry that woman or not. You don't know if you should make that business decision or not. You don't know if you need to enter into that relationship or not. You don't know if you need to go over to that person's house or not. Come on, young young people, young singles. Come on, talk back to me, young, young adults. Those of you that still got your hormones that are raging. Come on, I used to be one of them. You don't, you don't, you don't know if you need to go and get yourself in that predicament or not because you don't rightly, you hadn't been able to rightly discern that person's attitude and heart and thoughts towards you. But the Holy Spirit will speak to you on your way there and say, don't go. It can be anything. It can be anything. Excuse me. Yeah. Absolutely. You lack peace. Absolutely. When truth shows up, peace always is in the room. Hallelujah. Like I feel it right now. We're going to talk about this spirit of truth. I would only planned on spending maybe two Sundays on it, but boy, we really need to, I, I'm, I'm really discerning. We need to talk about this spirit of truth because there's so much deception in the land. People, do you know, and I don't want the people that God has called me to shepherd, people sitting up under my influence in any way. If, if you're a member or you're not a member, you're still, you've been up under my influence for the last 35, 40, 45 minutes. I don't want anybody to be up under my influence at who, who I'm not equipping to think for yourself. Don't even take everything I tell you for some. Go back and study it out. I'm not going to tell you a lie on purpose, but I do want you to go study it. Matter of fact, I'm probably going to give you more information than what you need. To support what I'm saying. But I'm telling you that, that because of the age of the social media, because of the age of the medium is so large, and the narratives, people have begun mastering how to twist and create narratives where there were no narratives. You don't know what to believe anymore. By the time we get done with this spirit of truth, you're going to know. You're going to know when you're hearing error. You're going to know when you've been told not to think for yourself. You're going to know when you're being told just to go along with the crowd because everybody else is doing it. What is the spirit of truth saying? Have you even asked the spirit of truth? No, we don't ask the spirit of truth because we don't relate to him as a person. But you can open up your mouth and you can ask him. And he will give you what you need. Hallelujah. Come on, one more time. Put your hands together and give God some praise. Come on, give him praise. Come on, praise him like you really mean it. Come on, praise him like you really mean it. Come on up, praise him. Come on, praise him like you really mean it. Come on, praise him like, come on. Come on, do you think God let such great word come up in here today because he didn't love you? Come on, praise him for his love. Praise him for his goodness. Praise him for his mercy. Hallelujah. Boy, y'all just stop praising because that's how we do, do in church. We just praise him for Come on, praise him. Don't stop praising him. Listen, this is a big sword. If somebody knows how I can get a hold of one of those little small daggers, let me know. No, seriously, don't laugh because I'm, I'm, I'm being serious. Because when you study the sword of the spirit that Ephesians chapter 6 is talking about, he's talking about a dagger. He's not talking about a big sword like this. I just brought this so that to illustrate, to impress into your imagination a sword, what a sword looks like. The Bible says, in the spirit, that means Pastor Tyler, come, in the spirit. We're going to talk about this next, 
next week. It says, praying in the spirit. Come, come stand shoulder, shoulder to shoulder with me. Where's Christian? Is he here today? Christian Orman? Can somebody go grab him? I always love using him. Christian is my little preacher. He helps me preach. But the Holy Spirit... Oh, try to hold it with one hand. That's quite difficult, isn't it? But what the Holy Spirit comes, he comes alongside of us. And he helps us to do this. Now, are you doing your arms like that in any type of direction that you want to go? You're going where I what? Tell you to go. Like that. That's what the Holy Ghost tells you to do. Hold this with one hand. Come on, hold it up with one hand. No, no, with one hand. <laughs> Christian said, are you crazy? Turn around to the people. You are Christian. Christian represents flesh. Trying to handle the word in your flesh. You are ill-equipped to mess with it. And also, are you ill-equipped, come on, devil, to do anything against the devil? But when you get in the spirit, the spirit comes alongside of you. And the spirit, whenever, wherever the devil tries to come, the spirit goes. The spirit won't let nothing get close to you. Because he's your protector. The word will protect you if you stay in it. The word of truth. It's the word of truth. You got to work the word and the word will work for you. So Father God, in Jesus' name, give Christian a big hand clap. Thank you, Christian. I love you. Pastor Tyler. If you're watching me, if you're in this room, I want you to look straight at me. I don't want you to close your eyes. Because when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, he didn't ask nobody to close their eyes. And I'm not saying anything's wrong with that. I'm just telling you, Jesus Christ is a public thing. Accepting Jesus Christ, he says, if you are ashamed to own me before men, he says, I will be ashamed to own you before my Father in heaven. If you, and you know who you are, if you're in this room or if you're watching me, if you need Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior right now, if you've never confessed Jesus as your Lord, you've never invited him into your heart to be your Lord and personal Savior, he is not indwelling on the inside of you. You've never had that experience. Some of you, you've had that experience but you need to get back in fellowship and relationship with him. He didn't leave you. You walked away from him. Open up the door of your heart and invite him to come back in. Recommit, rededicate your life back to him. Some of you, you need to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Jesus told his disciples, don't go forth in ministry until you, the, you receive power. The Holy Spirit will come on you. That's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. It's when the Spirit comes on you to empower you, to empower you, to come alongside of you and, and help you walk this life out successfully. Hallelujah. And then lastly, if you're not a member of anybody's church and you want to get hooked up and connected, with a dynamic ministry that's going to help you be rooted and grounded in your faith. It's going to help you to belong, believe, and become all you were meant to be in Christ and to realize and observe all of your God-ordained potential. This is the right place for you to be a member of the Restoration Place Church. Those four things. I want to invite Jesus Christ into my life. I need to rededicate my life to Christ. I want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, this thing you've been talking about, or this, 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 
this, this promise, the promise. I want to experience the promise coming upon me. Or I need to, I need to be, belong to a spiritual community. I want to become a member of the Restoration Place Church. Any one of those things, you fit in one of those categories, lift your hands tall. I'm tall and proud. Come on, go ahead. Wave it at me. If, if you're watching me digitally, wave your hand. Even though I can't see you, you can see me. Wave your hand at me. Go ahead and type in the comment section. There's something on the screen, instructions that will tell you if you made whatever decision that you made. Go ahead and type that letter in the comment section now. 